So what, what, what words of wisdom do you have for me, man? Oh, dude, just be at peace, you know? Just try to just go with it. Yeah. What about you, Bryce? Have any words of wisdom? Be at peace. I think he's at peace, too. Be at peace. All right, well, I think my parents are just about here, so let's load up and load out, my guy. Ugh. Whew. Let it go. Okay, too, man. You got this. Yep. You want to just grab the crutches and uh, the walker. I don't know how this surgery is going to go. The surgeons don't know how this surgery is going to go, but I'm choosing to remain positive. What are what are you afraid of, Mom? The unknown. Yeah. What the doctor said at this clinic is they've never seen a case like his ever before, so they're dealing with so many unknowns. They're just going to have to wait and see how it goes. So. It's all in God's hands. My name is Cam Ayala, and I'm 33 years young, and I was born and raised in Houston, Texas. About three years ago, I was on a popular reality television show called The Bachelorette. It's definitely the craziest thing I ever have done, and I was validated pretty quickly by Hannah by getting the first rose of the season, but after a couple of weeks of being out there, I was really, really on the fence about when and how I was gonna talk to her about this chronic disease that I have called lymphedema. So when I told her, everything seemed very well received at the time, but unfortunately, she had another conversation with another man in the mansion who basically accused me of creating this medical sob story so I could get a pity rose. And ultimately, that night at the rose ceremony, I was eliminated and sent home because she felt that I was lying to her. Unfortunately, when you're thrown out there into the spotlight and with the prevalence of social media, you're basically allowing access into your personal life for millions of people across the world, calling me creepy, calling me desperate, right? So when you're getting it from attacking your physical looks to your character, even death threats I received, you really just kind of roll into this ball of depression and self-doubt. You really start to believe that you're not worthy of love. At 11 years old, I was like most boys in the South. Sports was everything and my parents and family were very supportive of that. He's uh, full of laughter and fun and was always the, the class clown. He always wanted to be a leader. In high school, he was like class president and he played sports and just had a lot of friends. It was when I was 11 that I was playing YMCA summer basketball and I noticed a lot of lower back pain after every game. And after a year of going to over a dozen different specialty clinics, I was finally diagnosed with an incurable and a progressive disease called lymphedema. We all have a lymphatic system and the lymphatic system is responsible for moving lymphatic fluid throughout your body, which is directly correlated to your immune system. 
So when you have lymphedema, it basically means you have a compromised lymphatic system where basically picture if you've ever rolled or sprained your ankle and your ankle swells up, that's an accumulation of lymphatic fluid. So for me, it mostly presents in my right leg. So picture having a swollen leg that never goes away, that is always painful, and the only way to really manage it is by means of compression and by other modes of therapy that you have to do for the rest of your life. The amazing thing, he never made excuses for, for lack of a better word, his handicap that he had. He, he just, he, he, wouldn't, he didn't want anybody to know that that was an issue with him, that he was gonna, you know, compete head to head. I knew that I didn't want people to feel sorry for me. I didn't want special treatments, but there were still times where it would still kind of plague me you know, why can't I just be normal? Why do I have to have this? Why is this happening to me? He got made fun of a lot just because of having to wear a compression garment back then. They, you know, they didn't they, have him. He was the only one that had that one black leg and he went to the free throw line and I want him to forget this day. The opposing team was yelling at him, pantyhose, pantyhose. I just about got out of my seat and go to the court and tell them. And then Cameron made both shots. And then I said, tell them to stick it up their pantyhose. <laughs> so starting in 2014 is when I had my first bout of infection where I had to undergo emergency surgery. So from 2014 to the year 2020, I've had nine separate bouts of infection, which has resulted in 15 surgeries, 15 times of having to learn how to walk again. 15 times of putting your life, your career, friendships, relationships, finances, all on hold. I didn't know what the next day, the next month, the next year would bring. In 2016, I was living in Los Angeles, going through yet another bout of infection. This time, it was worse. I felt alone. I felt desperate, and I felt that at that point in time, I was better off dead. The pain was so severe, and for me, that was not a quality life, and I just wanted it to end altogether. He just, he wants to go on and have what we all take for granted as a normal life. You know, find someone to share a life and have a family and raise kids, I mean, he, it's, that probably gets to me more than anything else because I know how much you want that. Desperate for finding answers, I decided to embark on a journey, getting opinions all across the U.S. Heading to Philly. So I finally arrived here at CHOP, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and I met with a couple of the researchers here. Hopefully the report will give me some more insights on what's going on, so keep it posted. After those appointments, they determined that a knee replacement would be the best first step. Two weeks after that knee replacement, I developed a blood clot, which was life-threatening and by far the worst pain of my entire life when I had to be put in the back of an ambulance and escorted to the emergency room. It was in that moment that I actually had one of the most beautiful experiences of my life. That's where I saw the face of Jesus and he told me that everything was gonna be okay and that when I am weak, he is strong. That's when I reignited my relationship with Jesus was that afternoon when I thought I was gonna die. Morning. When you have an experience like that, it changes everything in your life. For years, I was so bitter towards God. I had rejected Him. I had blamed Him for my health condition. I had blamed Him for my failed relationships. But when you are humbled by a traumatic experience and you experience the Holy Spirit giving you relief, of not only that physical pain, but that spiritual pain, you realize that that's who you should be living for.
About a year after my total knee replacement, I could barely bend my right leg. I'm in terrible pain every day. It was clear that there was something wrong with the hardware that was placed in there. So in my mind, I knew that I could go the revision route, which would be three more additional surgeries and not even necessarily resolve the issue. Or I could do something a little bit more proactively radical, which would be an elective amputation. I am heading to Holmes Prosthetics to meet with a prostheticist to basically see what some of my options are. Part of the reason why I have mixed feelings about this appointment is I've had medical professionals and even some family members tell me that amputation may not be the best idea for me, but this is my life. I'm the one living it and this is worth just exploring. I've been living with terrible pain over the past eight years and some people think this is a radical way of going about it, but you know, radical change requires radical measures. Hello, Cam. How are you? John Holmes. Cam Ayala, nice to meet Hi, you. Cam. So, you're here, but you have two legs. Usually that doesn't happen in my business. <laughs> what yeah. you thinking? Well, really my main reason why I'm here today is to discuss if I do move forward with the above knee amputation, what life after amputation could be. Now, when somebody sees me preoperatively, that is generally what leads them to have amputation is the pain. Mm -hmm. I mean, after amputation, the expectation would be that's gone. Right. So that's huge. So if you choose and your doctors choose that it's the best thing, yes, we want an ideal amputation, about three quarters of the length of your limb. We want them to take the muscles, wrap them around. It's called a myodesis. Uh, it gives your muscles the best chance of working. So many visits here, six to 10 visits here. Therapy, 10 to 20 visits with therapy. So 30 visits, it's your right leg. You're gonna figure out how to drive. You know, that's important. So six months to two years from the date of amputation, then you kind of go, wow, this is what it's all about, huh? Mm. Hello, Cam. Hey. Bill. Cam, nice to meet you officially. Yeah. So may I? <laughs> all right. One of the most surreal moments in Tay's appointment was holding that prosthetic leg for the first time. I've done a lot of research, I've seen images online, but when you actually hold it yourself, feeling the tangible weight of the thing, it really did kind of hit me hard. The thing that makes me most emotional about this appointment is really just the optimism of me having a better quality of life. After 16 surgeries, I made the decision, enough is enough. I have definitively decided that I will be getting the above knee amputation surgery. I've been there for so much pain. And if this is the best thing that'll, you know, stop that, then it's, it's still a small price in the big scheme. We still have fears, but we have to respect them. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for allowing us to gather today with family, friends, and also want to thank you for all the many blessings you've given us in our daily lives. Bless this food for which we're about to eat to the nourishment of our bodies. And thank you more than ever for bringing your son here so we can all have everlasting life together. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. All right, dish up everybody.
Way to be bold. Don't be shy. Bring her over here. I want to be an active father. I want to be a little league coach. I want to walk my son or daughter down the aisle. Is she okay? She's doing great. I was a little bit like apprehensive about like his decision in the beginning, but now I, I fully support it because he's not gonna have to deal with this chronic pain that he's been dealing with for so long. So Cam, tell me about Philly. I haven't heard from you. You know, we do have a green light for the amputation. Hi. Okay. So that's happening, okay? Yeah. That's happening. <laughs> mm -hmm. I do know that I'm only presenting and swelling in my right upper leg now, but there is a chance for the potential progression of my lymphedema in my left leg. So, yeah, it's just something I have to be mindful of. One day at a time, one step at a time. Oh, and then come back with that. There it is. All right, let's do it. Slip. There it is. In preparation for the surgery, I wanted to be physically, spiritually, and emotionally as prepared as possible. Let's go. All right, so remember, you're not here for a long time. But I can't do that alone, right? I can't do that without God, first and foremost. But having someone like Terry, who has been such an inspiration to me as a man of God, as a loving husband, a loving father, and just an incredible physical trainer. In those moments after the workouts, when everybody else is left, we're just talking as brothers, the vulnerability comes out. And what's really powerful for me is that when he shows you his weakness, you find the strength in it. What I loved about Cam was that he knew what he was up against, he knew what he had just been through, and he also knew what he wanted, and he was gonna stink and get it. The Story Church has also been an incredible foundation for me. There's this Tuesday morning group of men that I meet with at the church, and we go through scripture, we support each other, we encourage each other, and we even share some of the struggles and doubts that is happening in our spiritual and personal lives. Time to get into scripture and very serendipitous just because of what we're gonna be discussing today. So everyone, let's turn to 1 Peter, and we're gonna be looking in chapter four. You, you there, John? Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, living for God. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourself also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. And, and Peter lays out uh, the purposes of these suffering, right? So with suffering, it tests and proves the genuineness of faith. It can have a purging effect. So basically living for God's purpose, not our worldly desires. And then the next element is it actually draws us closer in our relationship to God. And so that's another way that we can find unity in other believers who are going through the same um, you know, suffering or struggles in our faith. So as Dylan would say, this is a banger. A banger. <laughs> this is a banger. We, we got, we got a, a lot to, to unpack here. I think the more I've thought about suffering, the more I've realized there is this like weird inverse correlation between like godly suffering and sinfulness. Like if you're suffering for God, somehow there's less sin. Like I, I don't know how that works out, but I think there is kind of a correlation there. Yeah, yeah make sure that you know, none of you suffers as a murderer or a thief or evil or troublesome meddler. Right, but if you suffer as a Christian, mm -hmm. but if you suffer as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but he is glory to God, right? And so... How do we suffer as Christians? What is that? And not have a suffering complex, too. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I don't think we're in danger of that. I think we're in danger of, of wanting to seem impervious to everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the comfortable complex. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we take comfort and call it blessedness, right? Mm -hmm. Too blessed to stress, right? Right. You can't stand that. Yeah. Too blessed to be depressed. Yeah. <laughs> All that. It has got seeds of truth in it, but it's missing something. And uh, part of John's concern I'm sensing is like, am I not living radically enough to provoke the persecution of a hostile world? 
And I think that's something we should always be willing to ask. All right, so then we'll close out with a final prayer. This is the last prayer before my surgery. So mm, yeah, bro. why don't we lay hands yeah, on yeah, yeah. You want to get down. Yeah. Yeah. Having that accountability system to really lean into the Word of God and to share our struggles, but to also encourage one another has been an incredible catalyst to my growth and my own personal relationship with Jesus is to do it with a group of men who have really taken me in their arms and, and really helped foster that relationship with God. Lord, you know the cries of Cam's heart. You've heard everyone. Although he has been on the brinks many times and he has felt like he lacked the strength to continue, Lord, you have, have restored, renewed him each day. God, the world's about to see a miracle and you're going to show the world just what it looks like, just what healing looks like, what restoration looks like. I pray for Cam. I pray for renewed strength every day for the days ahead will be difficult. The road will be tough. But Lord, you are with Cam. You always have been and you especially are now. Lord Jesus, we thank you, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. So last night, I wrote a poem to commemorate this moment. Um, it's called, This Last Step. I'm stumbling over my words, just like my feet when I walk. I cannot recall my first steps, nor when I began to talk. If a whisper is to a crawl, then a shout is to a sprint. Sitting in silence without a leg, thinking where the time went. Take a knee to pray, take a knee to propose. What do I do with no knee? Get a pity rose? But my God has gone before me, so there's no need to fret. May I glorify him in all of my ways, even in this last step. Amen. As humans, we don't have the mental capacity to remember our very first steps. I'm gonna remember my last step with my right leg. That's a moment that I will cherish. It will be very bittersweet because this has been a leg that has carried me for 33 years. But the beauty of that is, <laughs> I'll also get the opportunity to remember my first step, my second first step with my prosthetic. And that's where the second half of my life will truly begin. And I will not take that for granted whatsoever. All righty, so I'm about to go back for surgery and um, God is good. He really is. I'm crying because they're tears of gratitude. And I know that this is gonna be a journey, but God has gone before me and it's gonna be a beautiful journey. Love you guys. not standing and greeting with the door. So it begins. So it begins. How you doing? Good. Um, believe it or not, it's not as painful than the knee replacement was. Really? Yeah. In that spirit, I got you give. Oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> I love the wrapping paper. Oh, it's just, you know, personal. Yeah. <laughs> got you. 
I, I just didn't know if you were floating. You're cold. So I just got you a sock. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it, it came with two, but the other well, one. Well, I have a spare then. Yeah. <laughs> the spare me. Thank you. You really socked it to me. <laughs> all in all, um, both surgeons felt pretty confident. You know, the amputation was pretty straightforward. Clean cut, as, as one would say. As you would say. As I would say. <laughs> Um, but the most intensive part was the plastic surgeon going in, all the nerve endings and connecting them to my quad and my hamstring. And it's really sore. Really? Like, really sore. You know, we're going to be there alongside of you to make sure, you know, making jokes and stuff is of course. great. We're going to keep yeah. doing that. Yeah. Lots of taking knee jokes yep. as we pray. Yeah. Just like that. Yep. But we also want to make sure you're being real. Yeah. With with yourself and with God and with us as your brothers. I, I need y'all. Yeah. So up till now, you haven't looked? I haven't seen it, no. It's the first time. Are you ready? Yeah. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this. Thank you for the pain, because I know that there's purpose in this. I am completely surrendering everything to God. So I am choosing faith over fear, and I know that's what's gonna get me through this journey, not just the next couple of weeks, couple months, but for the rest of my life. I guess that's Ready all uh, all righty. Yeah. Yep, right. let's give it a shot and see how it did. All right. I want to slide it on you and see what this looks like. Excited for today? It's a big day. Big day, yeah. Big day. Slide this up and hold on to those bars. Small steps, foot over foot. Tighten your butt. Don't let it bend. Tighten your butt. Hold it straight. There you go. Okay, now turn around. Good. So is it not been, okay, there you go, okay. Yeah, if you pause, it'll lock. Squats. There you go. You're doing great. You're, you're, you're gonna get right in there. It would be funny, but it is. <laughs> oh, it's okay. <laughs> oh my God, Kate, stop kicking yourself. Pain is, is a teacher, and I love a good acronym, and to me, I define pain as persevering against internal negativity. When you can persevere against that negativity, that's when you get on the other side of pain, which is the glory. And God has shown me that firsthand, and it's been giving me that fuel, the motivation to repurpose my pain. How are you? Good. Come on in. All right. So, uh, man, tell me about this this leg here. Uh, it's good. I'd say the biggest surprise is just having to think before I take every step. Uh huh. And that's something that I know I'll eventually get over. 
And I mean, it's kind of almost like a walk in faith. For me, it's learning to truly have faith in the technology wow. to do what it's supposed to do. And the biggest problem I've been having through this recovery is depression, like straight up. Um, I, I struggle with accepting my new body. Um, I struggle with that because there is this sense of inadequacy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like I build my upper body, but then I look down and I see like just this hanging piece of flesh. Mm -hmm. And if Lord will and I have a family and I have a kid who, you know, runs out in the street after a ball or whatever the case may be, am I gonna be fast enough or strong enough to protect my child? I think about that kind of stuff. Once I have those thoughts, they then compound to more negative self-talk. And I think that's what spirals my depression. Yeah, that's what's so devastating about depression. And it's not just the emotion you go through or the questions you're asking, it's what, what do you do with that? And talking about it, being open about it is uh, what you do with that to be healthy. The worst thing to do is keep it to yourself. I, I just bottle it down inside. And the depression and that negative self-talk in me says, you're not worthy of that, or you're not strong enough for that. You've reached your threshold. Yeah. And that's what I've been struggling with. I really have. And you know, I put on a brave face in social media and a lot of that is me. Yeah. And, and you've built such a persona around being an overcomer and victorious in all circumstances and fighting through that this is almost like, um, counter to your persona that you've built publicly. And so it can easily turn people who aren't really invested in you, for you, away. Because those people tend to use you for whatever they're looking for. And so the question becomes, to what extent do you rely on their affirmation versus being authentically who you are? Yeah, I think that's something that I've struggled with. Mm -hmm. Or if on some level you you want it because attention I, if is... my brain tells me that I need it, yes. I need the affirmations of the world. Yeah. All that world, man, is bullshit. Yeah. Like all of it. So if you want to present a true story, this is an essential chapter in that story. And presenting a polished, happy, finished product that's always victorious and overcoming is actually the least relatable story. It's not real. It's not real. And you have to be very careful at this point to guard yourself against performance as a lifestyle. This could just become another Bachelorette episode. And so we always have to be careful not to chase after a false idol of popularity. I think, Cam, it's a really important question for you to ask right now. If I'm not looking for that, what am I looking for? I just want to be real, man. Um, I want to feel like I've grown as a man through this all. Mm -hmm. Being real is the most important thing right now. Good, bad, and the ugly. How can we make sure that we can keep you on that path instead of going back to just being part real, part performer. That's the goal. That's what I want you to get at today. What's the real battle you're fighting? Who are your fellow soldiers in that fight? And who are you relying on for affirmation? Is it anyone other than God? If so, there's still work to be done in your soul your heart. I think that for Cam, the next chapter is the best chapter. Let's go.
he's had this kind of banner statement, this anthem, and it's faith over fear. And I love it because he doesn't just speak it, he lives it. This hurts like hell, but I'm pushing forward. Yesterday might have been terrible, today is challenging, but I'm choosing to believe tomorrow's gonna be wonderful. I think I'm gonna have to have conversations with him about slowing it down a little bit. He's gonna say no. And he's gonna prove me wrong. I'm a firm believer that this was piece of what God purposed for Cam's life. To have one leg and have more impact than any human walking on two legs, then this is what it was for. Good work, good work, good work, good work. Good work. After I graduated college and was really living a bachelor life, this perpetual cycle of leaning into alcohol and drugs and relationships with, with women, honestly, the more I leaned into that, the larger the void in my heart was. But the flip side is, when you give your life to Jesus, He's already forgiven all that. And though there's still moments where the enemy gets into my mind and I have thoughts of past terrible decisions, people that I've wronged or hurt, I know that what I have ahead of me is so much more beautiful and so much stronger than that. And that's the hope that I lean into. Oh 